Welcome once again to Off the Shelf, Books on Tour. I'm your host, Veronica Andrews, and I bring you a lot of books, of which I enjoy reading every one of them. A lot of books I wouldn't pick up, but I'm glad <laughs> I read them because I learned something. This book, Brilliant Beacons, The History of American Lighthouse, is my kind of book. Loved every word. <laughs> Mr. Eric J. Dolan has been here before. And I'm so glad you came back, and you did a marvelous job. Thank you very much for inviting me back, and thank you for the high praise. Like, wow. <laughs> I can imagine what your research on this book must be like. Did it take up a room in your house? Uh, yeah, well, I have an office in, in my house. It's a converted uh, garage. Mm -hmm. I, I used to work in the basement, which had very little light. And my wife got quite concerned that I was starting to grow moss on my back <laughs> and I needed to get out more. So we converted the garage into my office and mm -hmm. that's where I do a lot of my research. A lot of it is on the internet now. It's, a, it's amazing how many digitized old books you can get from the internet. I also go to a lot of local libraries. But for every book I've written, and this is my 12th book, I buy a mini library of books mm -hmm. on the topic I'm researching. For Brilliant Beacons, A History of the American Lighthouse, I purchased, I think it was about 85 books on lighthouses, and I had them behind me, behind my desk. Mm -hmm. So whenever I needed to double check something or find a piece of a story, I had easy access to those key books. And you're very proud of your research, 87 pages of notes. And references? <laughs> yeah, and that's down from when I, uh, a book I wrote uh, in 2007 called Leviathan, A History of Whaling in America, had 1,250 endnotes. And a, a lot of academic people really love that. I'm not sure my general readers liked it as much. And my editor said, you got to cut down the endnotes. And the reason I do that is because, consider my background. I have a PhD in public policy. Uh, I'm used to doing a lot of research, and I like to give credit where credit is due. But I, I That's do what cut it shows down. through in the 87 pages. The respect of the people who did the work before you, published it so that you could have 80 books behind you, yeah. and write authentically without a doubt of what they wrote on the history, what they were reading so often. What we read in research is one person's experience. It's not necessarily how it was going on in the world that day. Right. But just in their world. So I, I couldn't get over the notes and I, I thought you did a marvelous job. And I think it shows pride in your work and, and pride <laughs> in your research. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I do have pride in my research and my work. And I also feel it's very important to give credit to the people who made it possible for me to write this book. If I had to go track down all the information in this book, all the stories, from their absolute original sources, it would have taken me more than a decade, I'm sure, to write the book. However, there are a lot of primary sources in the book, but I also rely on really excellent secondary sources where necessary, and it's, it's great to be able to pull together information. A lot of my books span hundreds of years, hundreds of characters, and in order for me to be able to do my work and write a book that's easy to read, I need to rely on a lot of people that came before me. And every good writer, I think, will tell you that they stand on the shoulders of those who came before them and made it possible for them to tell the story. As will somebody 50 years from now be grateful to you <laughs> yeah. for doing a good job. Did you know it was the 300th year for the lighthouses when you started? I, I did, but there's a funny story about this book. For all my books, I usually pick the topic, mm -hmm. uh, and I submit it to my publisher and see if they want to uh, give me a contract. However, for this book, it was totally reversed. I had just finished a book called When America First Met China, and I had no idea what I was going to write next. I was flailing around looking for a book topic when my agent, my literary agent, got an email from my longtime editor at W.W. W. Norton, and the editor said that he had just had lunch with the head of sales, and they wanted to know if I was interested in writing a book about lighthouses. I had no idea because I knew almost nothing about lighthouses. So I went off for about a month, read a bunch of books on lighthouses, and I was absolutely floored. I was amazed at how many different strands of the American experience you could feed into a book 
on lighthouses. It wasn't just about lighthouses. It was about the creation of the nation, the growth of the United States, tragedy, disaster, engineering, and magnificence, construction. Birds. Uh, birds. <laughs> uh, birds. That was, that was an unusual chapter. Yeah, that's what I loved. I loved your balance. I love lighthouses, can you tell? Um, <laughs> you know, we visited many. I've grown up in New England. This, to me, is a lighthouse with the many pictures in the book, and they're great. Mm -hmm. If I saw one of those guys standing on 100-foot steel legs on a rock, <laughs> I'd wonder what a water tower was doing out there. Right. Because that, to me, is not a lighthouse. Right. Not the, there in are, my world. Th yeah, this, this beautiful example is what everybody thinks of as a stereotypical lighthouse. And an awful lot of lighthouses, especially in New England, are like this. Mm -hmm. uh, they have that sort of antique look. They're these conical structures. But a lot of lighthouses look quite different. And in fact, in my hometown of Marblehead, we have one of those steel or iron uh, skeletal tower lighthouses. And some people in town love it. Other people are not so enamored by it. I happen to like it. It's an unusual lighthouse. It's the only one in New England that's one of these uh, skeletal towers. But the reason that the lighthouse board built these towers for the most part was due to economy. They were cheaper and easier and quicker to build. In fact, in Marblehead, in the late 1800s, when they needed to build a new lighthouse, the lighthouse board was going to build a lighthouse that looked like this, a beautiful 100-foot brick lighthouse that could have been painted white, would have fit right into Marblehead. <laughs> Marblehead. But at the last minute, they opted for economy, and they built this 105-foot steel skeletal tower. <laughs> but uh, in our beach community where we summer, Every home that is rebuilt on the beach now has, can't have a cellar, mm -hmm. have to have openings in your foundation so the water can go through. Exactly. Rather than push your house over. Right. And flood it in a, a lighthouse on stilts. It may not last forever, but it's going to last through a couple of storms that could take us and did. Right. Take a 25 lighthouses went down in the hurricane in 1938. Yeah, and a lot of those lighthouses were not like this. They were on, they were on land. There was erosion. A lot of lighthouses have fallen over. But you're absolutely right. Those skeletal tower lighthouses were designed specifically for the Gulf Coast mainly mm -hmm. and the south where hurricanes hit quite often because they not only let the wind whip through, they let waves whip mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. So they are a little sturdier. But, but when you're coming up against the hurricane of 1938, which was a monster and came on without much warning, uh, a lot of lighthouses just couldn't stand a chance. But growing up here, I know about the Cathedral and the Pines. I right. know about the destruction my parents mm -hmm. lived through mm -hmm. the hurricane of 38. Never thought of the lighthouses. Right. Never gave, and, and people in the communities, if I understood it correctly, ran to the lighthouse as their wooden houses were going down the road right. for safekeeping, Yep. and they fall over. Yeah, the, the Prudence Island Lighthouse in Narragansett Bay, it was really a shame. Uh, the old keeper who had retired lived right down the road from the lighthouse, and he thought that the lighthouse was the sturdiest structure around, so he and his wife and, a fr and friends went to the lighthouse, knocked on the door, went in, but then a couple of hours later, the entire keeper's quarters was leveled, and the lighthouse itself, the tower, was gravely damaged, and a lot of those people that were in the, room, in the house lost their lives. There's another story in, that's not about the hurricane of 1938, the great hurricane of Galveston in 1900. 125 people sought refuge in the Bolivar Point Lighthouse, and they survived whereas six to 10,000 people, depending on the estimates, people died around them during the, that tragic hurricane. Isn't that, you know, what part did you find the most interesting, the lighthouses themselves or the keeper's stories? Uh, probably the keeper's stories. There's something always intriguing about the human element of people dealing with the environment and dealing with adversity. But I also love the stories about the lighthouses. One of the chapters that was the most fun to write was about marvels of engineering and construction. And that combined both the stories of the people who built, and in some cases died while mm -hmm. building the lighthouses, but it also had the fascinating story of how do you construct 
these very tall and very heavy towers uh, offshore in particular in areas that are covered by the tide maybe part of the day. Slippery moss. Slippery moss. Bird doings. Bird, bird. Was it Fallon, Fallon Lighthouse in California? Oh, Farallon Lighthouse. Oh on the, my on. god, that story was unbelievable. <laughs> Tell that one, I loved it. Which one, about the eggs about, or about, about the... About the birds attack. Oh. They couldn't get on it, so they had to slide over in like a bosun seat. Oh, oh and, okay. And, and then the bird said, get off my island. Right. And they can be nasty, so you're on a precipice like you've never seen. It's all wet. There's moss all under your feet, and the birds are attacking you. Right. Into the drink you go. <laughs> right. That, yeah, that was actually, that actually wasn't the Farallon Island. Okay. That was Tillamook Head yes. Lighthouse off silly of Oregon. Silly Tilly. <laughs> I terrible have, Tilly. Not I silly have tilly. a terrible <laughs> Tilly. My, my daughter's name is Tilly. Oh. <laughs> and I laughed when I read that one. Yeah, they had this, this, this basically basalt rock that's out off the, the coast. Uh, very strange shape. They had to put a lighthouse on top of it. But first they had to get there, so they would moor ships off, a little ways off, and then they had a rope, and you would sit in this bosun's chair and be, you know, pulled over to the rock. Mm -hmm. And it was quite uh, uh, an alarming at times uh, adventure because when the boat rocked, sometimes you and your bosun's chair got dunked into the freezing cold Pacific water and then were pulled up rapidly. Splash, and the first <laughs> thing they tried was a pair of pants. Right. So that you went into the pants and you were a little bit more secure than the bosun's right. chair. Right. But one man weighed 300 pounds. Oh, yeah. And didn't fit in the pants. <laughs> so the captain went out and had another pair yep. of pants made. And the guy still wasn't going to go, yeah. not, not in his <laughs> lifetime. So the captain jumped in, mm -hmm. and as he's on his way over, <laughs> his weight wasn't compensatory to the 300-pounder. Uh -huh. And down, <laughs> I can, can you imagine the guys laughing on the side, <laughs> covering their mouth, yeah. and trying not to laugh while the, the captain is being dunked for being a smart person? Yeah, mm -hmm. it, I'm sure they did. Although he was very well respected, so I don't think they laughed within sight of him. Yeah, but sometimes uh, that's even more fun <laughs> when they get done. But the eggs fascinated me. Now, the birds that attacked the people, the egg was the size of an ostrich egg? Not quite an ostrich, a goose egg. These are the common murres. They're, okay. They're birds. The, the story was, after the gold rush, lots of people went out to California to settle. Those people came from the East Coast primarily. On the East Coast, we had a lot of chickens, right? People loved eggs, souffles, things that you made with chickens. But the problem was in California, there weren't many chickens. But there was a ready substitute, the common myrrh, which is a bird that looks a little like a small penguin and nests offshore in these Farallon Islands, you used to lay a beautiful egg. Oftentimes it's blue and speckled, and it's about the size of a goose's. And you could use it as a substitute for chicken eggs. It's, uh, even Rich. though some, pe some people said it was a little fishy. Mm -hmm. But in the early 1850s, you could get a dollar twenty-five for twelve of these common myrrh eggs, which is a lot of was a lot of money back then, considering that the average lighthouse keeper at the time maybe made four hundred dollars a year. So this became a very valuable commodity. These guys that were called eggers used to come out to the island, take the eggs, but the lighthouse keepers either didn't want them to take the eggs or sometimes they wanted to benefit from the, the trade and the government didn't want the eggers there and there were altercations between the two over many years and one guy was even shot to death. Uh, they had a battle over these eggs. I bet you quite a few of them were in the drink because you got yeah. the birds going after them, yeah. the crewy <laughs> stuff underfoot, the lighthouse keeper telling them to go mm -hmm. away, the federal government telling them they don't belong here. Mm -hmm. I mean, against all odds, they still persevered. Yeah, well, when there's a lot of money on the line, people have an amazing way of overcoming Even obstacles. Even after they automated the light, they still go out and collect the eggs? No, no, the, no, the, the, uh, the egg collecting stopped for good in the early 1900s because the federal chickens government, <laughs> well, there are a lot of chickens out there. That was part mm -hmm. of the reason the price for these eggs went way down. But the real reason was the federal government finally used its muscle and made the islands totally off limits and protected the islands. And now the Farallon Islands are a national wildlife refuge and the population of common murres is skyrocketing as a result. They're being protected. So eventually the eggers were done in by economics because there were chickens going west just like humans and by the muscle of the federal government who was going to enforce 
its claim to the island. It was fascinating what it was like when it was under private ownership, like when they built Brewster Lighthouse here off Massachusetts, one of mm. the first. Yeah, oh, it was the first, the little Brewster, Build it Boston up, Lighthouse. The British burnt it down. Right. <laughs> Build it up again, the British burnt it down. Yeah. Building it up again, see the British coming, burn it down yourself, so <laughs> give them the pleasure. Have your manservant slave help you with the building. Yeah. I found that I'm naive. No, well, well, consider a lot of these lighthouses were built in the 1700s mm -hmm. and 1800s, well before the uh, Civil War. And there was a lot of slave labor all over the country, not just in the South. It was also in the North. That's what's surprising. And these are major construction projects. So mm -hmm. many, many unnamed slaves, we don't have good records of it, but many, many slaves and some free blacks also helped build a lot of the lighthouses. There were far fewer black people employed by the lighthouse board, but there were a few a black men that became assistant keepers, some lighthouses in the mid-Atlantic coast, not many. For the most part, the American lighthouse establishment up through the early 1900s was pretty lily white and mainly male, but there were a lot of female keepers. I love the female stories. <laughs> Weren't those girls good? Oh, they were huh? great, great. They great. did what men wouldn't do, yeah. couldn't do, and some say because of their size. Right. In their determination, and especially when children were involved. Yeah, I, I loved writing about the female keepers. There were almost 400 of them between the principal and the assistant keepers. And the reason I loved writing about them, the last three books that I wrote uh, had very guys. few. Yeah, had very <laughs> few male characters. And one bookseller <coughs> once pulled me into her office before I was giving a talk on the fur trade book, which uh -huh. you interviewed me about. And she said, Eric, I really like your books, but you don't have enough female characters. And I said, well, there weren't many female trappers, unfortunately. There weren't many female or whalemen. Or it wasn't written down. Or what, no, there weren't that many female trappers at that time. There were women that were out there mm -hmm. along with the mountain men mm -hmm. uh, as their wives, but not many that were actually doing the trapping. But with this book, there were hundreds of women who were lighthouse keepers, and they were just as good as the men that uh, they either replaced or followed. One was ex so extraordinary. I think she was there for 50 years. It could be, I could have this wrong. There's so much information. Yeah. My brain hurt. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, Edward Rose Snow, who became the Flying Santa right. after his predecessor, he was so impressed with the story of that woman keeper that he... Right, Abby Burgess. She wanted a lighthouse on her grave. Right. And nobody paid attention. Right. And Edward Rose Snow put a metal lighthouse yeah. on her grave. I, I like that guy. Oh, I, I love Edward Rose yes. Snow. He was like a raconteur and just an amazing man. I wish I could have met him. He wrote more than 50 books, and he wrote quite a few books on lighthouses. But he was somebody that really had an eye for history. And as you said, Abby Burgess died, and she actually wrote down. She said, someday I'd love to have a lighthouse on my headstone or near my grave, and he coordinated a ceremony in many years after she was gone mm -hmm. and put this little metal lighthouse, and it's still there today. Oh, thank God. I went and visited it. I, I hope nobody ever steals it. No. Mr. Edward Rose Snow attended the same school in Boston Harbor, Thompson's Island Academy. Mm -hmm. So he had grew up with the ocean all around him right. and the lighthouses, mm -hmm. and went on from there and it said it was his Christmas presents were paid for and accumulated by the Allerton Lighthouse in Hull, Mass, mm -hmm. graduate of Hull High School, <laughs> and he continued for 50 years being the yeah. Flying Santa. Yeah, he was, he was amazing, an amazing man. Mm -hmm. He always seemed to be happy. I, that's why I'd Doing love to meet him. Doing what he wanted to do, making yeah. other people. Isn't that unique? Yeah, it's <laughs> great. And he funded a lot of those trips out of his own pocket. And he was mm -hmm. just a high school teacher in Winthrop. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a, a wealthy man, mm -hmm. but he, had, he was wealthy when it came to spirit. And when you really believe in something mm -hmm. and you really want it done, right. did you have a favorite? Of all of them, of the stories or the lighthouses, uh, it's hard. Yeah, because I, tell I, me I, about I, I love so many of the stories. But one of the things that I most enjoyed writing was the an early chapter in the book, the chapter about the American Revolution, 
and how George Washington had personally ordered the attack, one of the attacks on Boston Lighthouse and also Sandy Hook Lighthouse. There was something very exciting about reading about all this back and forth battles over the lighthouses at the same time that the nation was coming into to being. But I also love the stories about rescues. Ida Lewis, who is, was a woman keeper in Newport, Rhode Island at the Lime Rock Lighthouse. She's credited with 18, saving 18 people. Uh, Kate Walker at the Robbins Reef Lighthouse in New York, a small woman, only four foot ten, barely a hundred pounds, Power. saved dozens of people according mm -hmm. to her own estimates, and she had some great stories. But it really, it is, I know it sounds like a cop out, but since I didn't know a lot about lighthouses before I started working on the book, every day was a revelation, and so well, many that's stories what you did to were me, fun. And I thought I was a lighthouse smart thing. <laughs> I was surprised, and it makes so much sense. But I only start mentioned once. Because the lens was a prism, mm -hmm. they had to put up a curtain during the day. Right. Because the sun would come in as a prism would and start a fire. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and they had enough fires with the whale oil and the yes. kerosene and everything. <laughs> I've never seen evidence of that when I toured Portland, Narragansett, Boston Light. That uh, it makes so much sense. Right. That they would have to put a curtain up and keep the sun out. But I'd never seen or heard that before. Well, there are probably a couple of reasons, because a lot of lighthouses today, even some of the ones you mentioned, no longer have their Fresnel lens. A lot of the Fresnel lenses have been replaced by modern optics, which don't have a problem of having the sun beat on them. But other, other lighthouses, like Boston <coughs> Lighthouse, which still has a beautiful Fresnel lens, uh, I haven't been there at all times of day. I don't know if they put up curtains, I think they might, but if they didn't, they might have special panes of glass yeah. now that no, are more it, protective yeah. from UV radiation, from the, the radiation. And also, they, it's not as much of a problem, because think about it. Back when they had whale oil or kerosene, much more volatile. It's, yeah, it can combust. If you have a light bulb now, which is what they have, that's not going to burst into flames being struck by yeah, very hot but, rays. Prism coming through, burned hole in wood. Yeah, well, there's not a lot of wood in, the, in these lantern rooms anymore. A lot of it's iron. So, but they haven't had any fires lately, so they must be doing is, a good job. This is a good thing. Of all the keepers' stories, and I'm sure for how much, when you finished with the 9,000 pages and you had to cut it down <laughs> to 500. Yes. Yeah, and there's only one keeper left. Right. Yeah, well, most, most lighthouses I became... I wonder if we shouldn't tell people who, where it is and make them buy oh, the book and find out for themselves. I, <laughs> I, I, I think you've done a good enough interview, so even if we tell them, they'll still be interested in reading the book. Okay, but you let it, it out of the book. Well, it's, it's, it's Boston Lighthouse. Uh, mm -hmm. Boston Lighthouse, the first lighthouse in the country, mm -hmm. is the only one that has a keeper left. But she's not a traditional keeper. She doesn't maintain the light. The Coast Guard does. Mm -hmm. But she is there because Senator Edward Kennedy passed a law in 1989 that mandated that Boston Lighthouse, because it's so important, have a keeper all the time to act as an interpreter to tell people about the history of this wonderful lighthouse when you get there. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. <laughs> now we're going to break for a minute, and Eric is going to read us a delightful <laughs> chant. Uh, it's, a, it's a poem, and then I'll read a short story. All right, we'll be back in a minute. Lighthouses had a number of jobs associated with them that the keepers had to perform, and I want to read a little bit about uh, a keeper's general perspective. One of the most labor-intensive jobs in the second department was polishing the brass fixtures on the lighting apparatus and the machinery clockwork, as well as many brass tools and appliances. After years of listening to keepers complain about this job, lighthouse machinist Fred Morong wrote a poem in the late 1920s entitled Brasswork or the Lighthouse Keeper's Lament, a few stanzas of which will suffice to drive home the message. Oh, what is the bane of the light keeper's life that causes him worry, struggle, and strife, that makes him use cuss words and beat his wife? It's brasswork. What makes him look ghastly, consumptive, and thin? What robs him of health, of vigor, and vim, and cause despair and drives him to sin? It's brasswork. 
And when I have polished until I am cold, and I'm taken aloft to the heavenly fold, will my harp and my crown be made of pure gold? No, brass work. And the, and the other thing I'd like to read real quickly is uh, inspectors used to go out to lighthouses to make sure that they were all ship shape. And this is a story of one inspector going to a lighthouse where the little girl, the daughter of the keeper, took things into her own hands. One of the most endearing stories of an inspection comes from Anna Bowen Hoag, whose father, Vern Bowen, was the keeper at Passage Island Lighthouse in Lake Superior, just a few miles from the Canadian border in the 1930s and early 1940s. When she was a young girl in the mid-1930s, Annie, as her family called her, took matters into her own hands soon after the inspector arrived. Not wanting her father to get any bad marks, she grabbed the inspector's hand as he walked by and asked him to sit beside her for a moment. As soon as he did, the precocious Annie launched into her pitch. Mr. Inspector, I want to show you some things that are very right with our lighthouse and island. You should concentrate on the good things instead of the bad. Her parents, nervous about what, was what she was going to do next, asked her to stop, but the inspector said that he wanted her to show him around. Annie led the inspector on a tour of the grounds, the oil storage building, and the tower, where she said he pretended to be impressed with the sparkling glass of the storm panes and the gleaming prisms as they cast their spectrums upon the lantern room. After this triumphant tour, Annie went back to the kitchen while the inspector finished his inspection with her father. The only thing I noticed while I gloated in my moment of glory Annie recalled, was that mother looked a bit pale. After the inspector had left, my mother and father banned me to my room forever. Though Annie was effectively grounded, fortunately things turned out acceptably. While the inspector issued a reprimand to her father, he passed the inspection and Annie said she learned to stay out of adult business after that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well done. I love the stories. And we're coming so close. I love that Thoreau and Einstein both <laughs> thought it would be a wonderful place to be locked away from society, noise, and interrupting people, uh -huh. have all their books around them and write in private without being disturbed. Uh -huh. And I love the story of Marcus Hanna, yeah. who can received the Congressional Medal of Honor in the Civil War, right. became a lighthouse keeper, uh, bravery beyond belief, and that mm -hmm. had to be about 20 or 30 years after the Civil War. Right. And he received the civilian a counterpart to the Congressional Medal of Honor for life saving. And he's the only one? The only one in history to ever get both medals. Brilliant Beacons, the history of American Lighthouse. Thank you very much. <laughs>